questions. I forgot today. I will post those on Blackboard. And so those are on Blackboard, not the fat lane. They're found in the same place that we do. this now. Um, and then if you're a new student, no reflections. Um, exam is this Friday, chapters 9, 10, and 11. Um, and then Thursday night, I know that you do that and I want to study, so come and decorate the uh, building with us. Um, the extra credit. So some of you hopefully saw that there's extra credit now posted on Blackboard. I don't care which one you do, we think it's fine. Um, but that is due the last day of classes. Have you all looked at it? Yes. How many are going to do movies? phosphodiester bonds. And this is actually an intermediate that can be isolated. So they know it, it's it's formed. Okay. We're gonna go through the the mechanism. So we're gonna do it up on the screen first and then we're gonna write these out. Here's my RNAs A. Um, it's actually a pretty small protein, so it's <coughs> cool um, There's my two histidines that are conserved. Uh, and then here in red, it's showing uh, a little substrate. And normally, RNAs A are going to be cut up big things, not just a little dotting for the top. Your book does these little blobs of the active sites, the cartoon version, so that the half circle here represents my enzyme, and then it's just showing my side chains that are coming off it. So here's one histidine, and then there's another histidine, and then here's my RNA substrate, and going off in your direction. Um, so uh, initially, this histidine is going to come and snag a proton from that 2 prime hydroxyl, and then that 2 prime hydroxyl can then nucleophilic really attack that phosphorus. Um, and then I'm going to end up breaking this other phosphate ester um, by grabbing a proton from the other histidine in my active site. Um, and this is shown as all being kind of a concerted thing happening. So looking at that very first step, how would you classify this?
controlled by the nucleophilic attack here because what is my nucleophile? Substrate. Substrate, yeah, my substrate is the nucleophile as well as the electrophile is nucleophilically attacking itself to make a cyclic <laughs> intermediate. Um, and so that's not an example of covalent catalysis because your enzyme has to be the nucleophile and I'm referring to it under that category. Okay, so this is just acid base. Um, not only is it acid base, but this is shown as happening all in the same step. I don't know how legit that really is. Um, but uh, when things appear to happen in the same step, where this one is acting as a base and that one is acting as an acid, then we say it is actually concerted acid base analysis. Okay. So now I have this little cyclic intermediate. So I'm from my two prime to my three prime position, the phosphate group is bridging both of them. And at this point, um, water is going to come in. Um, so this whole thing now, right here, this whole thing is going to be group. Okay, so half of my RNA strand is left. And then water comes in. Uh, and then this is sitting down here, which gave up this proton in the first step, is now going to grab a proton from the water. Um, the water then is going to nucleophilically attack the phosphorus. Um, and then we're going to end up breaking um, this bond here and grabbing a proton from the other histidine. So now this one's acting as a base. Okay, and this histidine is now acting as acid. The, acid. Okay, the nucleophilic attack is from water, not the enzyme. So this is also. Acid base. Catalysis, yeah, it's concerted again. Um, okay, so I'm going to write out our mechanism here. Histidine 12, and actually I have no desire for you to memorize what number of histidines they are. So as long as you know it's two histidines, I'm fine with that. Histidine number 12 removes the proton from the 2 prime hydroxyl. And so this is uh, specifically just that part of it is basic catalysis. This makes the 2 prime position a better nucleophile. to attack the phosphorus and the phosphate. And this is going to form forms a two prime, three prime cyclic intermediate. Okay, at the same time, Makes it a better group. <coughs> okay, that is acid catalysis. And together, those steps are concerted. into the active side. To undergo a reverse process. Where water is the nucleus.
to break the two prime, three prime cyclic phosphate. So this is um, an acid base catalyzed hydrolysis. Yeah. I'm not sure exactly, but like you do it without water, and that way it can go backwards and typically trap in the intermediate. It's going to be kind of hard to work with any kind of protein with no water around because that, that is the solvent of choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like probably going to do your protein with anything else. Well, deoxyribose. Well, that's probably, yeah, it's probably not going to work with an RNA assay. Now, there are DNAs that's out there, um, and they're going to have a slightly different mechanism because of that. So, um, you remove basically your 2' prime hydroxyl. <laughs> Especially an enzyme like this, where you have a side chain that has to act as both an acid and then later a base, and vice versa. Um, which means there's probably going to be a very narrow pH range that's going to work. Um, otherwise, all your histidines are protonated because it's too acidic, or all your histidines are deprotonated because it's too basic, and then the enzyme doesn't work. 
<coughs> now, most enzymes are going to be affected at some point by pH. Um, you can even think of it in terms of like nucleophiles. It has covalent catalysis going on um, uh, where you might need to deprotonate your nucleophile to make it a better nucleophile, and that's also going to be affected by pH. But um, acid-based catalysis by enzymes is by far the most sensitive type of mechanism for changes in pH. Okay, so that's a great one. What else? Yes? Well, I also said you could isolate that signal. Okay, so can we isolate any remediates? So you can see if you can trap an intermediates. Um, and if you can, can isolate or trap an intermediate, then that might give you a clue as to what the mechanism is. So in this case, they could. They were able to isolate that 2 prime, 3 prime cyclic intermediate. So they knew at some point they had to form that cyclic structure when hydrolyzing that phosphodiester bond. So it's, it's a clue to the mechanism. Um, there's a big one you're missing. Sorry? Um, yeah, you can look for inhibitors. Um, you can look for substrate or transition state analogs. Um, in this case, maybe that cyclic intermediate, you could look for a, 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 an analog that mimics that. Maybe it would, it would bind and, and track your enzyme. Um, and that's not done as often with acid-base catalysis as it is for some of the other types of catalysis we're going to see. Can you mutate the Yay. side of the protein? Yes. Mutate those histidines. Okay. If you want to know if that histidine is involved in catalysis, you can change it. If you want to know whether it is its base or acid properties that are important, um, sometimes you and substitute it with another amino acid that will work similarly. Um, now histidine is, again, kind of unique because it's PKA as <coughs> opposed to physiological pH, um, but there might not be much of anything else out there that would still work in its place. Um, but if you want to know if, if that's the catalytic residue that's being used, you change it. Change it to an alanine. Change it to something else that wouldn't work in that mechanism. So, second case study. So remember, this was a, an antibacterial agent that breaks down cell wall structures. This was a good example of um, a binding site site they're slightly different from each other. So you're binding when active sites um, overlap but are not identical. And what it does is it actually binds um, six And then A through F 
sorry, this is um, non reducing to reducing. And upon binding, the D ring is forced into a half chair configuration. Glycan, that's going back a couple chapters um, for that structure. And remember, so NAG was my N acetyl glucosamine, NAN was my N acetyl meramic acid, and they alternate between NAG and NAMs. And so um, this cuts between a NAM and a NAG, where this is position D and that's position E. Um, and it's going to break that glycosidic bond. Um, lysozyme is also a pretty small protein. This one's only about 14 kilodaltons in size. Um, but when we're looking at such a big thing that has to bind, because there are six of these polysaccharide rings that have to bind, um, it has this huge binding cleft along the surface of the enzyme. It goes all the way across. Um, and then towards the middle there, is, there's my D position and my E position where it's going to cut right here. And if you look at the active site, we've got some acidic side chains here that are involved in catalysis. So again, nam, nam, nag, nam, nag, nam, between the nam and the D position and the nam and the E position, that's where we're going to cut. Um, and now this is showing a regular kind of chair conformation um, for a, a carbohydrate ring and then the half chair. And here you can see here's the chair and then this one on D is a half chair configuration. And when it does bind in the cleft, it, it forces us to adopt that half chair, which is a higher energy state um, for that particular ring. All right, so going through the mechanism, uh, there's a glutamic acid, here's my aspartic acid. In the very first step, I'm going to break the glycosidic bond. That whole thing is going to leave. It does so by grabbing a proton from my glutamic acid. And then I form um, this carbocation, which is in resonance with a uh, oxonium ion. And that's why we can do this. So normally, carbocations aren't very stable in formation. That's going to be very rate limiting. But because it's stabilized by resonance, um, this, this catalysis pathway can actually go forward pretty quickly. Um, so the, they talk about this oxonium intermediate or transition state. Um, they're really talking about the resonance form of that carbocation that forms when this whole group is up and leaves. Okay, so in that very first step, what type of catalysis is taking place? is correct, but it's actually only one of the two. So which is it? Acid, acid catalysis. Yeah. So in this very first step, my glutamic acid is acting as an acid um, to break that bond. So <laughs> here we are at this kind of unstable high energy oxonium um, intermediate, or if you want, you can call that a transition state. Um, and at this point, now I have this aspartic acid, and it is going to attack that carbocation, and look what I just made here. This is the banana intermediate. So, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Employ all five, five possible things. Um, 
they're just more complex. So in this case, we're going to use more than one. And the one that includes all five factors. <laughs> 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 all right. So the can tell us if this is a winner. And um, this time, I actually am forming a covalent bond between my enzyme, between my aspartic acid side chain, and my substrate. Um, so this is covalent catalysis. And so here's my next covalent intermediate that is formed. Covalent intermediates can sometimes be trapped. You can actually isolate them or detect them um, over the course of the reaction. So um, if you can do that, then that's a big clue that, that you've got covalent catalysis occurring. Okay, so now I have my covalent intermediate. Um, this is where water comes in. Um, water is going to attack that anomeric carbon. Um, it's mediated by glutamic acid, which is acting as a base. Okay, makes water a better nucleophile if we deprotonate it. Um, and then my leading group is now the aspartic acid side chain. Okay, that's going to get us back to where we were at the very beginning, where our glutamic acid was protonated and our aspartic acid was deprotonated. So we've regenerated our active site through the whole thing. All right, so let's sort some of this out. Mechanism. So glutamic acid 35, again, I don't care if you know the numbers. Protonates. Um, o in glycosic bond to make it a better leading group. Okay. Now it is acid catalysis. Oxonium ion. Let me put this back up on the screen really quick. There it is. When you look at the oxonium ion, I have my ring. And normally rings um, that are like cyclohexane are going to have that chair conformation. Um, my oxonium ion has a double bond in the ring. What is that going to do to my ring shape? Yeah, so this is flat, right? So this is planar. Um, and so maybe I can flip up on this end and still have something that looks like chair-like, but then this is flat, and so you know you just raised your foot rest on your recliner. Now you have a half chair, correct? Okay. Um, do you remember then for our position D, when it binds, what is it forced to adopt? A half chair. I didn't do a multiple choice question for this one, but what type of catalysis does that represent? Not proximity. Preferential binding of the transition state. Preferential binding of the transition state, yeah. So oxonium ion, because of the double bond. Oh, yeah, maybe I should do that. <laughs> <laughs> so the oxonium ion, because of the double bond, is half chair. It has to be, because it's, it's got that double bond character. Um, so this lysozyme forces the D ring to adopt a half chair configuration. This is preferential transition state binding catalysis. Okay, 
Okay, so now we, we've used acid-base or yeah, acid-base catalysis, and we've used um, uh, preferential transition state binding and covalent catalysis. So this one does three out of the five. It probably is also doing the orientation and proximity because all enzymes do that to some degree, um, uh, especially since you have to bind your substrate across this huge cleft. I'm sure there's lots of little hydrogen bonding interactions going on there. Um, the only one it doesn't do is metal ion catalysis, so lysozyme does not require any metals. And then at our last step, the covalent intermediate is hydrolyzed. is acting as a base there, so this is base catalysis. So lysozyme uses acid-base catalysis, but it's not concerted, not like the RNAs A1, where you have acid and base steps happening in the same step. What's the word after acid? Uh, deep protonation, I'm sorry, deep pro period. <laughs> Thank you. Generates our active site, so that's that's the number one role of enzymes. It's a catalyst; it can't be consumed, um, so there has to be some <coughs> method in place to regenerate your active site. So it's just like it started. Okay. How can we improve this mechanism? What's going on? What are you usually going to play with? pH. Okay, so maybe there's some pH sensitivity, and maybe it's down there around the range where you've got some glutamic and some spartic acid side chain pKa's, which is somewhere down around what? Yeah, we're down to like three to four ish. Um, and so it might be a case where uh, you'd have to probably chop it to a pretty low pH to end up deprotonated. Um, but you don't have to go too high to get it to be where they're both deprotonated. Um, or it might be a case where you'd be happy to remove it. So it's probably going to be pH sensitive. What else can I do? Mutate. The aspartic acid or the glutamic acid. Um, how would you do? How would you specifically do it? Well, if you you can either just try to kill the enzyme activity altogether. So if you take an aspartic acid that you think is involved in acid-base catalysis and you change it to an alanine, it's going to do squat. Um, if you take the aspartic acid and you change it to a glutamic acid, it might work just fine, just like it used to. If you change it to um, something else that potentially could be acidic or basic, like a histidine, you might be able rescue it, but if you change it to anything else that's not ionizable, then you might destroy it. Um, sometimes you can glean information about the type of catalysis. Sometimes it's just telling you, yes, this particular amino acid has to be involved in catalysis in some way. Can you denature it? Can you denature it? Yeah, you could denature the enzyme, but that doesn't necessarily tell you what kind of mechanism is taking place. Oh, but meaning mutation. The mutation could potentially denature the enzyme. But um, usually if you're doing this kind of study, you would take the steps needed to prove that the enzyme still adopts a native structure. It's just no longer active. Um, and um, usually you see these spectroscopy 
a special poem I'm sure this is the most common thing that you that you haven't seen or probably ever heard of before. It's <laughs> another kind of um, actually we might see it. We're gonna see it in the paper coming. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in there. I'll take a look. Uh, but it's a way to, to show that yes, you're you're approaching soul adopting a summary structure without actually having to solve the structure. Okay. Alright, so maybe we just mutating, mutating those catalytic residues and proves that they're needed for catalysis. What else am I going to do? We can change our substrate to see where it's Substrate mimics. Enzymes that use preferential transition state binding. They, they, they tend to be irreversible inhibitors um, with enzymes that use that kind of catalysis. And as it turns out, um, there's a very good one for it as a um, So it is a, a NAD polymer that has a lactone. discovered that this was a very good inhibitor um, and before any structures were actually solved, they were kind of clued in that there, there must be some step um, where it's binding very strongly to a half chair confirmation. Um, again, these are all just kind of little clues. It takes a lot of experimental evidence from a lot of different techniques to actually work out. And even then, it's still for Is the same thing. Their binding site and their site is the same thing. They need to branch out a little bit, but it is. Lysis line, they overlap. Um, and in serine proteases, they're separate. So there's specificity for substrate.
Posisi dua. Dua. Minus the first u. Oh, there's got to be some sort of thing in there. chains that determine what the protease binds to, but it's the peptide bond that gets cut, not the side chain. It doesn't, the catalytic versus don't interact with the, the side chains. Okay. Uh, another thing to, to note about this is that um, the proteases are usually expressed as um, a P or a proenzyme. Distort the active side. Rendering inactive. And so this is really important for our digestive enzymes that when they're first made, um, like your pancreatic ones, when they're made in the pancreas, they're not active. Um, they have this extra internal segment that causes the protein to adopt an inactive form. And it isn't until they actually get released into the digestive tract that they're activated. Internal residues are cut off. Um, in the case of trypsin, it's autocatalytic. It cuts its own internal off. And then it becomes active. And that way, you are chewing up your pancreas, because you don't want to do that. You just want to chew up the food that you eat. Um, so a lot of these digestive enzymes are first expressed in an inactive form. So um, this table is going back to chapter 5. Um, there's our trypsin, containing trypsin. Um, and uh, you may remember trypsin that was really specific and cuts after arginines and lysines. Um, so this would be my arginine and my lysine, and then it cuts the peptide bond after it. And then, the and then chymotrypsin was cutting after those bulky hydrophobic residues. Um, so they have different ways they recognize. And the last phase, the last phase was small neutrals. When you look at the binding pockets for each one, um, up here is the peptide bond that we're breaking, but your enzyme is binding to these and recognize them based on that amino acid side chain that happens right before the bond that we're cutting. Um, and so for chymotrypsin and big hydrophobics, when you look in the binding pocket, you see little residues um, that allow this big bulky thing to actually get in there. Um, for lice, uh, uh, trypsin, where we're looking at lysines and arginines that want to bind, we see a little complementary negative charge in the bottom of my binding pocket that will help bring those in. Um, and then again, smaller side chains to allow that big side chain room. Uh, but the last phase is the little small, uh, small hydrophobics, the nonpolars. And in this case, I've got um, these uh, side chains that occlude. So they're blocking that pocket so only little things can fit in here. Um, so this is how the enzymes know where to cut um, what peptide bond in another protein sequence. And it's all based on how well those amino side chains fit into these little binding pockets. Okay. Uh, and then trypsin, uh, again, is an autocatalytic. So initially, when it's, when it's expressed, um, it has this internal region. And there's a lysine here at the 15th residue in from the internus. Um, and then it, it, this is interior peptase or trypsin. So trypsin can actually come and cut its own proenzyme in order to make the active trypsin. So this leaves, um, now that first residue is an isoleucine 
Um, and when this is gone, my active site can adopt its new and active form. Um, when the internus is here, it actually interacts with the active site in such a way that it's distorted. but in all sorts of hydrolysis. You find it all over the place. And it's called a catalytic triad, um, where you have three essential conserved residues. They're usually a serine, histidine, and an aspartic acid, usually. Sometimes the serine could be a cysteine. Um, that's a common change. So we have a, a thiol and some of the group there. Um, histidine, you don't see change very often, but the aspartic acid, sometimes you see it as a glutamic acid or some other group that can form a strong but there's three of them that are essential for enzyme function. Okay, so again, we're going to walk through the pictures and then we're going to go back and write up the mechanisms. So, again, catalytic triad, the ascorbic acid, the histidine, and the serine. Um, my serine is going to act as a nucleophile. It's going to nucleophilically attack the carbonyl in my peptide bond. It does that because histidine comes and grabs away a proton to make it a better nucleophile. Um, so this proton is pulled away as this is attacking. Um, the histidine can do this because the aspartic acid is hydrogen bonding to the other NH out here, and it's an inductive effect um, where, where we're actually, because this is kind of pulling this positive charge towards it, um, then it makes this a stronger base uses the negative charge on that ring. Um, so since this is a strong base, they can pull away, because you can use a strong base, right? So serine, remember what PK is, serine is? Five, how high? Thirteen. Thirteen. It's thirteen, and, and twelve is kind of our cutoff for physiological <coughs> PKAs. So you've got to have something here to help make the cysteine a stronger base than it would be normally in order to be for negative base serine. Okay, so serine attacks, pops that out, and I have a tetrahedral covalent intermediate where this is actually bound to that. So what kind of catalysis is this? Mm -hmm. Covalent and, and base and oh, this one's not an acid. It's holding it there. It has some inductive effects, but it's holding it in a certain position. Mm -hmm. It really falls in the proximity orientation. So it's the serine is covalent catalysis, the histidine is base catalysis, the ascorbic acid is position of orientation. All three in the same step. So here's my tetrahedral intermediate. Um, this again isn't intermediate, it collapses right away. So I'm going to pop this back down to reform the carbonyl. When I do that, I'm going to break the peptide bond and that is helped along by grabbing the proton back from the histidine to protonate the nitrogen to make it a better leaving group. Okay. That has cut my peptide bond in two. So now I have this side, which has the old C terminus and a new N terminus, and then I have this side, which has the old N terminus and a new C terminus. Um, so I still have a covalent intermediate here that hasn't changed. Um, what kind of catalysis is going on here? Um, that's what the catalysis is. 
acid catalysis. So my histidine acts as a basement acid and a basement acid. Um, four sequential steps there. My serine is, is the covalent catalysis. Okay, so at that point I have regenerated my active site and now my, my protein fragment here with a new C terminus, the old N terminus can leave. And now the fragment is gone and I'm ready to start over again. Yes? Mm -hmm. Catalytic triad, one of the most common mechanisms for hydrolases. We're going to write this out as fast as we can. And we might, we might tail over a little bit on that same measure. Um, so just use it as a mechanism. Just use it as catalytic triad, which is a conserved So the mechanism we looked at was specifically for chymotrypsin. And again, the serine sometimes just exists there instead. You know, you're going to see that in the paper you read.